Let's start to talk about history of microprocessors. Okay, since this is the first week, you probably heard a company called the Fairchild, Fairchild Semiconductor. This was actually founded in 1957, probably the one of the first companies of semiconductor business. Okay, and they invented the first uh, IC in 1959, and much later in 1968, the guys called these three. Robert Noyes, Gordon Moore, Andrew Grove. Have you heard these guys? No? Okay. Um, maybe, maybe this guy, you probably heard about it, if you're interested. Maybe in the, in the newspaper or some other places, you may have heard Moore's Law, and this is the guy, Moore's Law. Okay? So these three guys were employee of Fairchild, but they later resigned from Fairchild and founded their own company called Intel. So you probably heard Intel, right? This was founded much later, like 1968, by these three guys. So these three guys um, were CEO of Intel, okay? And these are very famous guys, right? Of course, a, a millionaire, maybe billionaire, okay? And this Intel, after that, um, is grown from the three, uh, three man startup to 1968 and uh, becomes industry giant in 1981. So they were very successful in making a semiconductors and microprocessor business. Initially, even now, Intel is doing a microprocessor business, right? They're doing a lot of semiconductor. Still, the, day, the Intel is the number one company of semiconductor. Uh, but their main business is the microprocessor design, right? So they have so many employees now. So the, when, I, when we see the history of microprocessor, Intel is the company we have to talk about first, right? So in 1971, they introduced, they developed a microprocessor called the Intel 4004, okay? So this one looks like this. That was a 4-bit microprocessor, okay, 4-bit. Okay, I, I, I'll tell you what that means by 4-bit later, but sounds like this is a very uh, small microprocessor, right? This 4 means this 4, okay? So they name it this way because this is 4-bit microprocessor. And later, they introduced another 4-bit microprocessor, a little bit more advanced 4-bit microprocessor, okay? 4040 in 1974. And as time goes, they later introduced an 8-bit microprocessor and they changed the, type, changed the name 4008 and 4080, uh, right? So the, it was a 4-bit, now it's an 8-bit, okay? And as the number, this bit, number of bits increases, what that means is they have more semiconductors inside. They have more uh, gates inside so that they can execute. They can run more number of instructions per second, okay? This is only like 50,000 instructions per second. Okay, because this is just 8 bit and this one runs like a kilohertz of, probably kilohertz of clock frequency. So this is so slow and so tiny microprocessor because that, but still the, that was a very good one in 1972. It was like 40 years ago, right? It was 40 years ago. So now you may guess that since this is a 40 year old microprocessor, maybe we no longer use this, right? This is 40 years old. So maybe these days, we have to use maybe 32, 32-bit microprocessor, things like that, right? However, that, that may be true, but however, this kind of 8-bit microprocessor is still used, even now, still being used. In fact, this 8051, right? This 8051, the one that we are learning, this is an 8-bit, 8-bit microprocessor. So now, <coughs> You may want to ask a question then. 8-bit microprocessor was introduced almost 30, 40 years ago. Why we are learning 8-bit now? Maybe that's a question you want to ask, right? Maybe we should learn 32-bit microprocessor, maybe. 
but that's not but maybe maybe true but the thing is that once you understand the 8 bit microprocessor completely then it's very easy to understand 32 bit okay and it's uh, it's much easier to understand 8 bit okay so we need to start from 8 bit microprocessor once you understand uh, some of the basics and how to use 8 bit like a 8051 then later if you want if you want later you can uh, use a 16-bit, 32-bit microprocessor very easily when you need it. Like a, when, you, when you get a job and go to industry, then you probably use a 32-bit microprocessor. In certain cases, then it's very easy when you understand the whole thing. Okay? This is another 8-bit microprocessor. You see that the number of instructions per second is now 10 times more than the previous. Right? What does that mean? This basically means that uh, you can run more instructions per second, which means that it runs faster. Okay? This is a 16-bit. Another 16-bit, right? You see that there are more pins. Yeah, and the bigger one. And you see that now it can, uh, it can execute 2.5 million instructions per second. So it's much more than before, the previous version. You see the million instruction per second, right? This is called MIPS. We call this MIPS. MIPS, okay? MIPS, MIPS. MIPS is the unit, okay? The unit, which we use always for microprocessor. So when you, when you look at the microprocessor, we always see that, okay, this microprocessor is 2.5 MIPS. This one, this one is also 2.5 MIPS, but uh, some other processor you see, maybe it's a 10 MIPS, 100 MIPS. What that means is you can execute that many instructions per second. Okay, that's the MIPS. Okay, so you need to, um, this is a basic terminology, so at least you need to know what MIPS means. Okay, this one also can access one megabyte of memory, also the number of uh, the size of the memory it can access is increasing as it goes. Okay, so this is another 16-bit uh, microprocessor. This is a, um, another one, it's more advanced, uh, has a faster clock, and it actually has a more uh, address space. Earlier it was like a two megabytes of uh, address space, but it has more address space. I'll tell you more detail about the, what address space means uh, later. In fact, uh, look at here. The clock speed was 8 megahertz. It was very fast at that time. That time was 30 years ago, right? But now, the, if you look at the PC, right? What's the clock frequency of the PC? These days, maybe 1 gig, right? 1 gigahertz. We call it gig, mean gigahertz. This one we call the Mac, megahertz, megahertz Mac, okay, gigahertz gig. So these days we use a one gig, three gig, that, that is the speed these days. Later, in 1986, 32-bit microprocessor was introduced. Uh, this was called the 386, and later 486, these are all 32-bit microprocessor. Of course, a number, the, the size of the address space is increased, and also the number of execution, number of instructions is increasing. Uh, maybe one question. Why do you think this is a 4 gig? Wh what is a 4 gig? Maybe, forget the 1 gig. What is a 1 meg? One mega, one megabyte. What is one megabyte? I mean, the, how big is it? Maybe we can start from the basic one. Let's, let's see. We are talking about binary here. Two to the ten. What is it? Right. This is one K. Right? So, one meg is what? Is two to the? 
huh? Two to the power of what? Twenty, right? Twenty. It's twenty, right? Because it's one million, right? So now let's say one gig. It's what? Two to the thirty. So let's say we have a thirty-two. Then what is it? Four gig. Okay. So if you have, some of you may have an old version of Windows. Windows, uh, Windows 2000 or Windows Vista, things like this, right? Or even now, the Windows 7 have a two different version, right? 32-bit, 64-bit version, right? So let's say if you use a Windows 7 32-bit version, okay? But your laptop, your, your or your PC has only four has has eight gigabytes of memory, okay? Then what happened? You have a problem, right? Because your Windows PC, uh, not Windows, your Windows 7 32-bit version has the address space of 32-bit. What that means is. Your OS, your Windows 7 32-bit version, have only this much of address space, but physically you have this much. Okay? So which means that even though you have 8 gigabytes of memory, you cannot use it because, uh, because OS, Windows, can see only this much. So you are wasting. Okay? You cannot use the, the other 4 gig. You're only using 4 gig. You, you know this, right? You know this. So if you have a physical memory, RAM, if you have a memory higher than 4 gig, then you should use 64 gig, 64 bit version of Windows. So all these are related. Now you understand why, right? If you have address space of 32 bit, then this is the whole, this is the all the address you can have. Okay? So you see here, the, this one has the address space of 4 gig which means that this one has address space of 32-bit. Okay? That's what they mean. Later in 80486, 80, cache memory was introduced. So I'll tell you what, what it is, right? This is one of the uh, very good technology they introduced in the microprocessor. We are talking about the architecture of the microprocessor. Maybe this one looks almost the same as this one, if you see it. But if you look at inside, then this one has a cache memory. What is cache? I'll tell you later, okay? Cache. So this is important. This is one of the, this is a, simply speaking, that's a memory, <coughs> but that's very fast memory, okay? Uh, We'll look at it later. Uh, another 32-bit version called the Pentium, right? This one has a cache memory, but not just one, but two. But later, not even this one, but later microprocessor, they are doing also the layered cache, layer two, layer one, you know, several different hierarchical uh, structure of the cache. So this one has more instructions. So, so far, even Pentium and Pentium Pro so far, what Intel have done was that they are trying to make a faster microprocessor, right? If you look at uh, the specification of each microprocessor, they increase the number of instructions per second, okay? Earlier, it was a 2.5 MIPS. Now, it's like 100 MIPS or more than 100 MIPS, right? And also, they increase the size of the data width and also increase the address space. So they are making bigger and faster. That's what they have done, right, so far. So during the uh, first maybe 20 years or maybe 30 years, okay, They're, what they have done is that they want to design faster processor or bigger processor. That's what they have done. Now, the, in almost in 2000 or maybe later in 1990, 1990s, maybe 1995 or some, sometime around this, they now have problem. What's the problem? All this thing, all this processor is designed, is manufactured by silicon, right? Silicon. Silicon 
has its own problem, which is that um, this kind of chip cannot, the clock speed cannot be increased infinitely, right? Now, the, now think about that. Maybe um, five years ago, if you buy a computer, right, PC, personal computer, microprocessor was maybe something with the maybe one, gigabit, one gigahertz of speed, clock speed. Five years later now, if you buy another PC, then the clock speed is still like one gigahertz or two gigahertz, right? But if you see that this, uh, if you see this, right, they kind of increase the clock speed maybe 10 times per every five years or something like that. They increase the speed, okay, every, every time. But now the clock speed cannot be increased anymore. You probably never see the microprocessor with the 10 gigahertz of clock frequency or maybe 20 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz of you know, frequency. You cannot see it. Okay? We are almost in the dead end. We cannot increase it more because of this uh, material, silicon. Okay? Then what that means is they are done, right? Their business is to make a faster microprocessor, right? And bigger microprocessor every time, but they cannot increase it anymore. So what they should do? They still have to do business, right? They have still have to introduce a new processor, you know, keep doing, but they cannot increase it anymore. So naturally what they have to do is that they have to think about other things. What is that? Two things, yeah, that's uh, one point. One thing is that um, clock speed may be the same because we cannot increase it anymore, but we want to reduce the power consumption, low power version. That's one trend, one path. So they are trying to reduce the power consumption and things like that, that's another one way, uh, which is for typically for laptop, right? Laptop, you wanna uh, reduce the power consumption. Right? Because with one battery, you want to, without charging, without charging, you can use for like, a, like a multiple days, right? So laptop need a low power version. However, there's a, some other computer which needs high performance. For high performance, you have to increase the clock frequency, we can, but we cannot do it. So for high performance version, what can you do? Yeah. Naturally, they are thinking about to increase the number of cores, multi-core, multi-processor, okay? That's another thing they are thinking. They, they, they start to think about at some time in 1990, later 1990s. So Xeon, Xeon is a one, uh, one of the processor with the multiple cores, okay? Earlier, they introduced, introduced this processor for servers very high performing servers. But later, even in the PC, personal computer, we use quad core these days, right? Hexa core, things like that, right? So they introduced the dual core and hexa core, you know, many cores. That's, the, that's what they are doing even now. So the, you probably won't see the number of clocks is getting increased, but you'll see that the number of cores is increasing or parallel processing and things like that, right? That's what they are doing. And also they increase the number of uh, data, the size of the data width, 32 or even 64, things like that. That's how the uh, microprocessors are evolved, okay? They uh, introduce new processors. Earlier they keep increasing the clock speed, but later they switch it and they are introducing the multiprocessor multi-core, even the hyper-thread kind of software technology built into it, okay, doing the parallel processing. Okay, that's how the microprocessor is developed. So this one, this slide shows you a summary of the history. So all the things I, I told you, uh, starting from four bit all the way to the 64 bit, okay? Throughout the, these are all the version, the example.
of the processors. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, briefly look at the other part. What is embedded systems? Embedded systems. All of these are embedded systems. You, you see embedded system every day, everywhere. So let's say you go home. What embedded systems do you have in your home? Many things. Washing machine. Washing machine these days, this is a washing machine, right? Washing machine has a microprocessor inside. Okay? Freezer, refrigerator has a microprocessor. Pretty much these are all the house appliances. All these house appliances have a microprocessor. Of course, uh, iPad or, you know, the pad or smartphone, of course this one has a microprocessor. Not just one, this one has multiple microprocessors. You, you know that, right? You know that? This, this one especially, right, has a multiple microprocessors for some reason. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about that in the next slides. Cars. Maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, Every, everyone believes that car is full of mechanics, like engine, right, or wheels. All this, this is actually full of mechanical parts, right? However, these days, this is no longer mechanics, okay? In the car, you have so many electro, electrical parts. So question here, do you know how many microprocessors do you have in the car, in any car? Guess. Guess how many? Eight million. Huh? Eight million? Man, that's too many. <laughs> I thought that you were saying maybe two or something, but million is too much. Um, we still have engine, right? Mechanical parts. Okay? Well, maybe the another question is, why do you think you need a microprocessor in the car? Why do you need it? Because the en once you have an engine, the car is going, right? That's a basic functionality of the car. So why do you need the microcontrollers? For many, for safety. safety. That's one issue. Uh, like a, maybe airbag or something like that. There should be sensors. Okay? These days, there are so many. So I'll give you an uh, answer. It depends on the car, but some of the low-end car, okay? low-cost car. These days, you have maybe uh, 10 to 20, 30 microprocessors. But if you see a, some premium cars, right, some expensive cars, these days, the uh, expensive cars have like 100 or maybe 150 microprocessors, okay, in the car. Why do you need that many? Um, you have cameras, okay? Well, when you have camera, you should have microprocessor to control the camera. You have so many sensors, so many sensors, right? AR sensor, proximity sensor, whatever sensor, so many. So you need so many microprocessors. And not only that, since you have so many sensors in everywhere, these sensors and these devices should connect, should talk each other. So you have a network inside. That's called the car network, okay? Since we have a car network inside, okay, each one you need the microprocessor. And not only that, in the engine control you have microprocessor. But now, guess what? Let's say we have a car. I bought a, a, some old car, okay? And when I drive, for some reason, since my car is old, my microprocessor, okay, I have a microprocessor which controls the engine, but suppose that that processor is suddenly dead. Then what happens? <laughs> My engine stops, right, suddenly. Then that's a big disaster. So that's why even in the car, you should have a multiple microprocessor. So one processor is dead, you have a backup processor. Okay? If this is dead, another processor. right? So it's like a multiple processors for backup. For safety reason, you have uh, many, many processors in car. Monitor, of course, you, uh, you open the 
you open the case, you have a microprocessor, right? Uh, this is not my house, of course, right? <laughs> this is, uh, I wish I have this house, but uh, this is a kitchen, right? You have uh, so many appliances which is automatically um, <coughs> turned on and turned off, maybe cooking, things like that. So these are full of microprocessors doing a lot of things. So the point here is that you see microprocessor every, everywhere, everywhere, okay? Everywhere. So we, we need to know all these things. So let's look at the cell phone because we are all familiar with cell phone. This is an actual uh, picture of iPhone, but this is not an iPhone 4 or 5. This is a little bit old one. Maybe th this is, a, I think, 3, iPhone 3 or 3S. So if you open iPhone, this is the picture, exact picture. OK? Uh, in fact, you see the so many chips doing so many things, right? But most important thing is that we have two processors. One is called the application processor. We call this AP, okay? There's another processor called the baseband processor. We call the BP, okay? So it's something like this. Uh, maybe this, is, this whole thing is a human, human being. It's like with a two head, okay? We have a two brain. This is the whole body. Since this is a body, you should have hands, right? You should have leg. So they, those things are some of these things. We have some dis, uh, display interface. We have some uh, controller for touch screen. Okay, we have some RF component. Okay, there are some other chips. But the brain, the most important things is these two. So let's say what it is, right? Let's understand why we have these two processors. Does anyone know why we have these two? Huh? Speed. Okay. Mm, no. Speed is not the reason that we have two. Hmm? Uh, the reason is smartphone. Okay. That's a good reason. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> what is a smartphone? Yeah, then maybe that's a question. Okay, simply speaking, we have two brains, right? This one, baseband processor, okay? This one is doing all of the communication work. This iPhone, right? Every cell phone, the basic functionality is to make a phone call or send a text message or web surfing, right? So you need, this is a communication device, right? So this baseband processor is doing everything about the communications. If you don't have this, right, then you cannot do any communications. So that baseband processor is doing all the communication, everything about communications. Then what is the application processor? Application processor is doing everything about apps. You have apps, right? That's what he means, the, the smartphone. Smartphone, we have a big screen and you have operating system, maybe Android, something like this, right? And on top of that, you can download apps and you can run the apps, okay? So this processor basically uh, runs the apps, okay? Game or whatever apps you want, okay? So that's what this does. So that's why we, have, we need two different processors. Maybe in the TV, on TV you see like a quad core cell phone, uh, the smartphone, things like that, right? You probably, did you hear that? Maybe Galaxy 4? I'm not sure, but Galaxy 4, things like that, they use a dual core or quad core, things like this, right? I'm, I'm not sure, is, is that correct? So they, they probably do an advertisement, like uh, quad-core smartphone, things like that. 
So when you look at that thing, right, that kind of advertisement, then you should understand what that means. When they say quad core, quad core, right, meaning, meaning four cores, right, this is a four core. That's what they mean. They don't talk about the details, but this one is a four core. That's quad core. BP and all the other thing will be exactly the same. This one cannot be quad core. BP, in fact, this is very complex. Uh, this one has a, a couple of cores inside, actually. Uh, but uh, we never call that as a quad core or hexa core, dual core. Okay, this is just one. But this one may be dual core, hexa core, quad core. Okay, so when they see the quad core, this is the one that they are talking about. Um, now then, uh, let's say we were using 3G phone, 3G smartphone. Maybe some of you these days are using LTE phone, maybe, right? Since the, you see the LTE every day on TV. So if you have an LTE phone, what's the difference between your phone, LTE phone, and this one? Only the difference is this one. Okay? This one. If you use a 2G, 3G, or LTE, this one should be changed because you are using new communication technology. LTE is a new communication technology. So they are using LTE baseband processor. Okay? My phone is still 3G, so my phone is using 3G baseband processor. Okay? This one is called a modem. Modem, okay? Modulation and demodulation, we put that together, we short as modem, okay? This is modem. And this one is application processor which runs everything, like apps, right? So that's uh, how the smartphone looks like these days. So as I said, there are uh, so many components of the embedded systems. So for example, as, as we see in the, 3G, in the iPhone uh, dissection, we need the 2G, 3G, or 4G wireless technology. If you think about the cell phone, that it is a communication device anyway, so you need the wireless technology, right? And not only that, you need to have a processor, maybe multiple of processors. You need the memory for code and data. We'll, we'll learn this one uh, next week. And various uh, peripherals. What is this one? Have you heard this word, peripherals? Okay, uh, throughout this course, you need to understand these kind of words. This is always so basic word, okay? So this is the opportunity for you to get familiar with these kind of words, peripheral. Peripheral basically means is that you have a processor, okay? And let's say a cell phone. What else do you have? You have a processor, but you have a touch screen. You have a screen, LCD, LED maybe. What else? You have a buttons, right? And you have a serial port, cable port. All of these things is called the peripherals. All those other parts, outside, external parts, except the microprocessor. Microprocessor is a microprocessor, but all the other part, that is called the peripherals. Okay, serial port, the buttons, right? LCD, output, all those things are peripherals. We also need a software platform. For example, operating system. In fact, let's go back to this one. Since we have two different processors, right? Each processor, you need the operating system. In our personal computer, in our PC, we have a my operating system, right? For example, Windows 7. That's operating system we use. In this processor, what is the operating system? For application processor, we have operating system like Android or iOS. Apple use iOS, okay? Or Symbian, Nokia phone. Or some of those things, right? Android, iOS, those are operating system which run on here. Okay? Then what about this one? 
This is another processor, right? This processor has to have also its own operating system. Okay? Have you heard any operating system about this one? This operating system, probably you never heard about it uh, because that's not our interest. You probably don't see it in the, in the newspaper and things like that. There are other processors like a PSOS and some other process, some other operating systems. But later when you get a job and you work industry, maybe Samsung or something like that, then some of you probably hear about the operating system running here. Okay? There are some other operating system which runs here. So point here is that every processor you should have operating system. Okay? Every processor. But in this case, we have two. So you need a two different operating system. We need operating system. And on top of operating system, you need to have embedded software and application software. And also when you, let's say you are an engineer who developed this phone, then you need to, you need to have a debug, debugging capability, right? Also, you need to have some software for maintenance. Okay, so so far is a brief introduction about microprocessor. Now let's start, uh, I think, chapter one of this book. So in this book, it starts uh, with the, some of the basis of number systems. Easy start. In the numbers, we have integers and fractional numbers. Integers are something like five or 2, 20, things like that, right? What about minus 2? That's also integer, okay? Negative integer, positive integer, and 0, okay? Negative, positive, 0, all these are integers. What is a fractional number? Fractional number is like this, 2 point something, 2.65625, or 3.75, that's a fractional number, okay? So we have a, we can classify integer versus the fractional numbers. And integers, we, use, in sometimes we, in the binary system, we represent integers into this way. So this is a binary representation. You, you know that, right? This 101 is 5. You, you know how to convert these two, right? You learned this one, right? If you don't know that, then you should know because uh, maybe this is part of the quiz one, the first quiz. Not today, maybe uh, next week or, or two weeks later. But this is so easy, right? This is like high school, high school problem, high school quiz. This is a binary representation. How to convert between these two is to use this one. The last bit is two to the zero. First one is two to the one, right? So in this case, it's 101. So the last bit is 2 to the 0, which is 1. And the second last one is 1 is 2 to the 2. 2 to the power 2, so it's 4. 4 plus 1 is 5, right? It's very easy. So that's how to represent in the binary system. This is a hexadecimal system. In hexadecimal system, you make a group of 4 bits. These 4 bits are one group, right? These 4 bits is another group. So in this group, you read it. This is just 1. And in this group, again, you read the same way in the binary. Then it's 2 to the 0, 2 to the power 1, 2 to the power 2, 2 to the power 3. So this is 8, this is 1. Put them together, it becomes 9. So if you read this one in hexadecimal system, it's a 1, 9, H. H means hex, which is 25 in decimal system. Okay. In daily life, we see this decimal system, right? 25. In decimal number, we just simply write as 25. But in hexadecimal number, we sh you should say 19H. If you don't have H, then it's a decimal, right? In hexadecimal system, you should put H. In binary, you should put B, OK? OK, remember that, OK? If I have this quiz, some of you, I'm sure that some of you probably do a mistake and don't put H, okay? Some of you forget to put H. That's wrong, okay? You should put H 
if you write it hexadecimal. Okay, don't forget it. And binary, you have to have B. So it's so easy to convert between the hexadecimal and binary and de decimal numbers. Now let's look at the fractional numbers. There are two different ways to write the fractional numbers. This is one way. There are another way uh, that the, on, the other way we learn it maybe, maybe later, much later. That's a little bit complex. So this is a little bit easy. So let's introduce this one. In the fractional numbers, we still have 8 bits. This one, we have 8 bit, right? Same way, we have 8 bit. But with this 8 bit, now you put the bar, this red bar, and the first 3 bits we call as the integer part, and the other 5 bits we call the fractional part. This is just the example. Okay, it's just an example. Maybe you can put the red bar here. In that way, the integer part 4 bit, this is 4 bit. Okay, this is just an example. But if, if you put this one in here, then the first three is integer, the other five is a fractional part. So the first, the last bit in the integer part becomes 2 to the 0, same way as here. But in the fractional part, it goes to the negative. This first one in the fractional part becomes 2 to the minus 1. This one, which is the second bit in the fractional part, 2 to the minus 2, 2 to the minus 3, 2 to the minus 4. Okay? So that's how things, uh, how, that's how we represent it. So this one is the integer part, second last bit, so that's the 2 to the 1, so that's 2, which is this one, 2. Right? In the fractional part, you have 1 here, which is 2 to the minus 1. What is 2 to the minus 1? 0 0.5. 2 to the minus 1, right? Half. So we have half. Right? So in this example, it's like 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So we put the bar here, so that's the 2 to the minus 1, which is 0 0.5. <coughs> 2 to the minus 2, it's 0, so forget it. This one is 2 to the minus 3, which is this one. The last one is 2 to the minus 5, this is? Okay, so you have a one here, one here, one here. So what you do is you are doing addition of this. Okay, that's what you what you're doing. So in that case, what's the value? Uh, do you have a calculator? It's like a zero point. Uh, I think that one six five six two five. I think. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, so that's how you write it. But now, you may ask a question. What if, what if you have a value 2.65626? Okay, the last one is 6. Then, then how, how can you do it? In that case, the binary representation will be still same. Okay, even though you have a 6, it's going to be still same. In that case, it's not equal, right? But since we have only five bits for fractional part, this is the best I can do. If you want to have accurate number, exactly six, then you need more bits, right? But we have only five bits. That's all I have. So this is, best. This is the best I can. This is the closest to, to six, okay? So there is a, some error in that case. So we'll look at uh, those things uh, when you have time later. Another basic one. Um, as I said, integer, there is also uh, negative integers, right? So let's look at the negative integers. So these are the binary, uh, the, the positive integers, right? We are looking at the binary numbers. So let's see the signed binary numbers. See here, 5 is a 0, 1, 0. Okay? 
then what is minus 5? How can you represent negative numbers? There are three ways to do it. You learned this one, right? In another class, right? Right? Uh, one way to do it is that sign magnitude binary numbers. So what that means is we have a sign. We have a magnitude. Okay? So the first bit is a sign. Zero means positive. One means negative. So first bit is a sign. And the other seven bits is the magnitude. Absolute number. Okay? So this is five. And if you put the absolute value, this is still five. Right? Magnitude is still five. So the other seven bits is the same. Only difference between this one and this one is the sign bit, the first bit. Okay? That's a sign magnitude representation. <clears throat> Another way is that one's complement. Okay? So what is a one's complement is that this is a 5, 101. And if you want to make a minus 5, then for each bit you flip. Okay? 0 becomes 1, 1 becomes 0. Just flipping. All the bits, flipping. That's this one. Okay? Since this is a positive, this is negative, simply flip all the bits. That's one's complement. Looks like a, this is pretty easy, right? When you change the sign, you, you can simply change the first bit, which is sign bit. Very simple. This one is also pretty simple. Because when you want to make a negative, you flip all the bits. Very simple. But we have problems of these two. What's the problem? Yes, that's right. Let's say we have a zero, right? Then zero, 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 right? Then what if I change the sign bit only? Then it's like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's going to be minus 0. So what is minus 0? There's no minus 0, right? But in this case, in this representation, you, you have minus 0. This one has the same problem, right? You have all 0. You flip all that. All 1. All 1 becomes minus 0. So that's uh, very unnecessary because there's no minus 0. So therefore, we introduced Two's complement, and this is the most popular one, right? These days, all the digital computers, pretty much this is used. Okay, this is used. Two's complement. So what is the two's complement? Is that, let's say you want to have a minus five, then first you, you do the one's complement, okay? You flip all the bits like this, and then plus one. So here is one's complement. You do a plus one, then becomes two's complement. So this is minus five. Looks like this is uh, easy, but let's say maybe in quiz, if I give you minus five, okay? Maybe I give you this one, right? This one, this one, okay? And let's make it positive number. Then can you do that? What I'm asking is that you should be able to do this way and also reverse way. Right? From here to here is easy. But here to here, maybe not. Okay? But you should do it. Anyway, so this is the binary numbers and this is the most popular one. And when you use two's complement, especially in this case we have eight bits, right? With the eight bits, when you have two's complement, this is the number. This is the whole number you can represent with this two's complement. With eight bits, you can represent uh, from minus 128 all the way to positive 127. Okay? These are all the numbers you can have with a two's complement. In this case, there's no minus zero. Right? You have only zero, which is good. And you have one more negative number. Okay? So that's two's complement.
Uh, this is the last slide. This is a basic block diagram of 8051 processor. Okay. Uh, throughout this course, we're going to learn some details and some of the architectures of 8051. And this is just an overview. This is the inside of microprocessor. Inside microprocessor, the most important thing, probably most important block is ALU, arithmetic logic unit, ALU. Okay? A Oh yeah, ALU. Okay? This whole thing this whole thing is inside this one, okay? This is a microprocessor. Actually called the CPU, but this whole thing is inside here. So this is the block which which do actual calculation. Let's say you want to do addition. Okay? Or multiplication. Okay? When you do calculation, this is the block they're doing actual calculation, okay? So inside the microprocessor, we should have ALU. What is this one? We have registers in microprocessors. What, what are registers? Simply speaking, registers are some small buffer, small memory. You know, buffer, memory is the same thing, okay? Buffer, memory, same thing. So this is memory, simply speaking. What is memory then? Hmm? Memory, G, memory is a storage. Storage, right? Just some storage. So we have uh, some memory here, and you can, uh, you can put your number or value into the register. Okay, we have uh, many different registers. We'll see this, uh, some of the details later, okay? But we have internal memory called the registers. And we have also another memory called the internal RAM, okay? Internal RAM. So again, we'll look at it in a little bit detail later. And uh, there's another memory called ROM. What is the difference between these two? What does it mean? Yeah, what, what is it? Okay, yeah, right, but when, when can you, when do you use ROM? Hmm? Yeah, so this is read-only memory. So you can only read, you cannot write. Okay, then why do you need this? You cannot write. You can only read. So what is the purpose of this read-only memory? The basic purpose is that you have your own program, okay? Let's say you want to do some, uh, some calculation, right? You, you do C programming and you compile it, right? And your program will be downloaded into ROM, <coughs> okay? Once you download it, you, you don't change it and you, you are not gonna uh, write it, okay? You simply read. Okay, and calculate. So this ROM typically is called the instruction memory. Instruction means uh, your code. Your code is instruction, okay? This ROM typically have your instructions. Whereas this one, RAM, okay? Random access memory. This one is a read and write. You can also write, okay? So when you do the calculation, right, then your value should go into a certain memory. For example, this one, right? You should hold your memory. So let's, uh, let's put example. Let me give you a very simple C program. Maybe that's easier for you. I have a C program like this, okay? understand what it is, right? So we have a simple C program. I'll have A equal to 1, 
b equal to 2, and I define c, c equal to a plus b. You know the answer, right? But we are, we are not interested in answer. What I'd like to know is that this is a C program. I'm, I'm, going, to co I'm going to compile this one. When you, when you compile this program, then you're going to have a binary, right? This is a C program. This is a my program.c. This is your program, right? And you compile it. Okay? Then eventually, maybe your program becomes uh, some binary. Okay? And this one is a binary, like uh, some 7f3c, something like this, right? It becomes binary. And this binary data, okay, goes to instruction memory. Okay? Because this is memory, right? This is instruction memory, and later, microprocessor basically read, basically read this one, read this one, and execute. Okay? Then, that's how you calculate this one. Now then, the question is that, where is A? A and B, C, right? We define these things, right? right? So where is the A and B and C? Yes, that's right. Sometimes it goes to register. In this case, actually, it's a very simple example. So most likely, this one goes to register. But think about that uh, we, we have some We have another program like this. So this function is swapping A and B. Actually, you don't, you don't need this. In this case, you are just swapping the value, right? A goes to B, B goes to A, okay? Swapping. In order to do the swapping, typically you need another temporary memory. Do you know what I'm saying? So what this means is that you have A equal to 1, B equal to 2. And what I like to do is to swap this value. A equal to 2, B equal to 1. That's what I want. How can you do it? You need temporary memory. You understand that, right? Why is that? Because when you copy this one into here, right, then this value is gone. Right? So you cannot put it back because this value is gone. So therefore, in order to swapping, typically what you need to do is that you want to make this one you need to make a backup copy, and then put this one here, and then put that back in here. That's how you swap it, right? So this kind of temporary memory will be here. When you do calculation, right, this kind of temporary memory will be there everywhere. This one goes to, so there are different memories, like a register, an internal memory. There's a memory called the stack, okay? There's stack memory, heap, and internal memory, and read-only memory, registers, there are so many different memories, okay? But uh, sometimes they put this one into registers, but some other times they put into the internal memory called stack. Stack is right here, okay? We'll look at these things later, okay? Later, but anyway, so we need this memory to have some value, temporary value. And this is for instructions. Okay? And we have a clock circuit because this is a digital circuit. And interrupt circuit. This is very important, interrupt. Uh, we'll, we'll see that later. Input output ports. Okay? So these are the th basic blocks for 8051 and any other microprocessors. So here's a microprocessor. We need the RAM outside. Uh, this is ROM, but these days we, uh, we don't use the traditional ROM. We typically use a flash because this is actually better. We can re-flash, right? re-download. And this is erasable, erasable ROM. So this is a little bit advanced ROM, advanced version of the ROM. But anyway, this is ROM. 
which means this is the instruction memory. So this is instruction memory. This is called the data memory. Okay? And there are other circuits, as I said, interrupts and serial communications and timers and counters. All these things are very important part of this microprocessor. We'll learn this one later. Okay? And we have input output ports like this. Uh, that's it pretty much for today. Any question? Okay, see you next week.